and Jacob, uh, not to, to get you to repeat some of what you said <laughs> earlier, but uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on, on scaling this up? How do we do this? Yeah, so like I said in my presentation uh, this morning, I've kind of been rethinking this and the way I think about it um, starts at the big picture and let's work our way down. So the big picture is that food systems are, we have to, they're holistic. If you have a, any farmer, rancher, any kind of food producer here knows you can't create food without water. And, and, and around the world, we see when water disappears, food supply disappears. And yet the conversations we've been having in that big picture have been excluding the sectors of our economy and our government that have a huge impact on whether we have water or not. So from the Indigenous viewpoint, and this is how we look at it, is we look at it as the whole system. So on my farm, we immediately after buying that farmland, cash, by the way, because I couldn't get any financing, <laughs> um, was talking to the hereditary chiefs about all the logging and, and saying, hey, can we kind of push that back and protect our watershed so we can continue to water our crops? And then we're working together on that. Um, so we see in the big picture, things get siloed. And this is where I've been saying, you know, this initiative that we're undertaking here around regenerative agriculture, indigenous agriculture, it should be to the equal scope and scale of the LNG strategy in BC. So we should go, this is super important. It's a complicated thing. We have multiple ministries and levels of government that need to be on board from the ocean to the mountains, to the prairies and beyond. Why are we not all sitting at the table and going, what kind of things do we need to change in order to make this shift work? Because we're not there yet. So that's the big picture, okay? Um, and that's something we deal with because to us, a uh, food system in the ocean is agriculture as much as a food system in a lake or on a field or in a forest, that's all agriculture for, to an indigenous person. And we don't separate them or silo them or treat them differently. And so uh, that's part of the scaling of regenerative is like, what does regenerative look like in an ocean system? Uh, what does it look like in a field? What does it look like in a, in a forestry type environment? Um, you know, so that's one part. The next thing is knowledge. Uh, the, the, the lack of uh, available um, appropriate information is a huge barrier. So for me, what got T Creek really springing into action was going and visiting what we now call regenerative farms south of the border and seeing like this incredibly healthy ecosystem of small scale, uh, organic, regenerative, profitable farms uh, doing really well. And a lot of them and visiting and going, it was all like my head kept exploding every day with all this new information mm -hmm. that was had been in place for a long time there south of the border and going, why are we not doing this in BC? So I think that's the next thing is as soon as I knew it was possible, I wanted to do it, right? I wanted to put that into action on our farm. I want it to be profitable. I want to be sustainable. I want to be regenerative. I want to be friendly to the, to the earth and to the ecosystem. So I think that's, uh, that's the next piece. And then the last little detail piece, as we're kind of driving down this, this iceberg or whatever, um, is when it actually comes time to buy compost, uh, get a broad fork, get a power harrow, switch uh, from a plow to a subsoiler, those things are incredibly difficult to get in Canada. Mm in the whole country, you're searching from them for them, not in a BC context, you're searching them in a Canada context. And most of the time you can't find them or you're competing for the like three power harrows that exist in the whole country, right? And then you're paying this ridiculous premium. So the cost, the dollar cost to get into regenerative agriculture right now at a very base level, if I want to switch from a rototiller to a power harrow is prohibitive right now in BC. So you, if you realistically expect farms to start switching, uh, we need to lower that price, that cost of entry somehow. And I'm not going to be the policy guy that, you know, that tells you how to do it, but, but that realistically has to change. Like it's, it's very difficult. We face that. We train people on our farm. They want to do it. And then we show them like, here's the cost. And, you know, I, I think we're all probably in a very similar boat. The price tag's too high, right? It's easier to just go dust off the rototiller and just keep doing that than it is to, um, to go buy. And if you're First Nations, as you know from my keynote this morning, that barrier is even higher when no one's lending you money. So that's it for me. 
Yeah, I really like those. I, I appreciate the, the different scales you just described. And I, the next question that I was thinking about is prioritization. And I wonder, I mean, it seems like all of those things need to happen sort of simultaneously, but is there, given, given the limited budget and, and emphasis at this point that we have on this, uh, this strategic development project, uh, is there a way that we can prioritize? Can you, can you identify things that really, you know, we've got to do now, we've got to do first? Uh, okay, I'll speak from the Indigenous perspective. Our priority is food production. Like the lowest, best path uh, to get there. So, um, and then there's values that feed into that. Like uh, all the First Nations we work with, none of them want to do conventional chemical agriculture. We're not... Um, inherently opposed to that like we will teach it um, and we understand like hey if, if your soil is completely depleted and you need to grow vegetables this season that may be the only feasible path is to is to go go a chemical route to get that and so we're not going to stand in your way and say no you shouldn't eat this year you know don't don't use chemicals so so we have a very sort of agnostic non uh, entrenched view of food production and we're like hey the priority really should be uh, production and, and how do we do that in a regenerative way that's good for us and good for the planet? Um, now, in terms of prioritizing, that's a really hard one because I'm the kind of guy, if I'm at the Monopoly board and someone says, you only get 100 bucks, I'm like, but I can see a million bucks in the bank over there. I know, it's a tough question. It's <laughs> not a fair. Question. It is not <laughs> a fair question. You want it all. No, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just like, that's where I'm like, hey, they did it for LNG. Why can't we do it for regen, right? Like, come on. It, you know, we're not trying to break the rules here. It's, it's already been done. We just need to make it a priority and get the dollars behind it. So um, I was just in Europe and that's what I see them doing over there. Mm -hmm. So the way they've been dealing with the transition on mass is uh, just uh, government uh, contributions to the farmers to lower the cost of switching, right? So that uh, 300,000 euro cost, you know, gets reduced by at least 100,000 euros. Um, so that's how they're doing it. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not answering your question. Sorry about that. But I know on no, ours, that's fine. <laughs> it's, it's production and the, the sweet spot for us is hand farming. So if you've only got a hundred bo bucks at the monopoly board and you need to produce, uh, you know, 15,000 pounds of food on a hundred bucks, then it's like, go get your broad fork, you know, get your lightweight, uh, tilling device and your seeds and uh, learn how to mulch and suppress your weeds and produce a ton of food with not a lot of money. So that's how I do it. And, and just to clarify, before we move back towards Chris on this question, uh, the role of agritech, when you're describing the broad fork, <laughs> are, you, are you saying that- I'm famous for broad forks, by the way, everybody, because yes. I, I use it as the example that uh, on this exact topic, I say, you know, at Tea Creek, we buy lots of broad forks, uh, you know, for loosening the soil and, and reducing your tillage. And it's a very simple tool. And, and I was saying in, in, in Canada, they're very hard to find. You can't just go to your hardware store. Like they don't, they're not there. And, uh, and they're very, very expensive. So, that, so that's where the broad fork reference is, is in the States, they're 90 to hundred bucks American. In Canada, once they've shipped to you from wherever is three to $400 for the same basic tool. So I've been saying, why can't we make those here? Uh, why aren't we making more of them? You know, closest manufacturer of broad forks in Canada is Ontario and it's not a great broad fork. So we still import them from the States. So when we, we talk about Agritech, we're not just talking about fancy sensors. We're talking some basic tools. Here. Super basic tools. Like, come on guys, can't, can, can't we start welding together some metal? And <laughs> <laughs> So Chris, how about you? Do, you? do you see some some ways to prioritize here if you get that $100 from the Monopoly board? There's there some things that you can...